we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. We have adopted a plan for the complete withdrawal of all U.S. combat ground forces. We are finally bringing American men home. The American troops were gone, and as a result, the House of Cards began to collapse. We were dealing with an ambassador who was just convinced that somehow there wouldn't have to be an evacuation, and therefore there wouldn't have to be a concern about evacuating South Vietnamese. These people were dead men walking. Sometimes there's an issue not of legal and illegal, but right or wrong. I borrowed a truck, and I drove them to the airbase. And I had told them, when you hear three thumps, that means hold the baby's mouths, don't breathe, don't talk, don't make any noise. I was going to get them out. The final battle of Saigon has begun. That morning, there must have been at least 10,000 people ringing the embassy. There was a sea of people wanting to get out. They looked up at the helicopters leaving, and I could see their eyes, desperate eyes. There are no words to describe what a ship looks like. It holds 200, and it's got 2,000 on it. We have no more helicopters. That's it. As it took off, I could see the group right where we had left them. It was just so serious and deep a betrayal. Who goes? And who gets left behind? Using stunning archive footage, Last Days in Vietnam follows the chaotic final days of the Vietnam War. The North Vietnamese Army closes in on Saigon as South Vietnamese resistance crumbles. The United States has only a skeleton crew of diplomats and military operatives still in the country. As communist victory becomes inevitable and the U.S. readies to withdraw, evacuation of South Vietnamese civilians becomes terminally delayed by, the congressional, by congressional gridlock and the inexplicably optimistic U.S. ambassador. With the clock ticking and the city under fire, a number of heroic Americans take matters into their own hands. If this all sounds like an action thriller, that's because it was. But Last Days in Vietnam is also one of the documentaries which has been shortlisted for Best Documentary Feature for the upcoming Oscars. I'm pleased to be joined by half the Moxie Firecracker team, documentary director and producer Rory Kennedy. Good morning. Good morning. It's Good morning, great Rory. to be here. Same here. Uh, glad to have you in from Los Angeles. Yes. Right? Yes. Nice to be yeah. back home, really, right. in Brooklyn, which yeah. is where I kind of hail from, I would say, at least over the last 10 or 15 years. I yeah, think. yeah. Um, uh, uh, did you start, you started your company, Moxie Firecracker, right here? And now? Yeah, we started it. My partner, Liz Garbus, and I started Moxie Firecracker about uh, maybe 15 years ago now. Wow. Yeah. Um, so here in New York, and then we moved to Brooklyn, raised our families here, and then I just recently moved to Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, and last days in Vietnam, uh, this is uh, maybe your f uh, second film that you made? Or out, out, out in L.A., I mean. Oh, well, yes. It, you're more removed from the documentary community. Is there, is there much of a community? Of, there is of, a documentary community out there. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's, um, it's not quite as big, but there's a significant one, and there's some great talk. You know, R.J. Cutler's out there, Davis Guggenheim, mm -hmm. um, Lucy Walker. There's some really terrific filmmakers out there, Kata Men. So um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful community. But it's, you know, L.A. is more spread out, so right. I would say it's um, not quite as tight-knit as it is here in New York. Gotcha. Um, so when did you get the, first get the idea to make uh, a documentary about Vietnam and specifically about the, the days of the 
you know, around the fall of Saigon. Yeah. Those last well, days. I started developing the film about two and a half years ago, and at that time, it seemed that we were on the brink of getting out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, that's what we were hearing anyway, and so I thought maybe that if I, we looked back on what happened at the end of the war in Vietnam during those final days, maybe there were some lessons to be learned um, and some insights that would be applicable to uh, the mm -hmm. withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so that was, that was part of my interest in, in approaching the material, and I think, indeed, uh, there's, there's, it feels like there's a lot that we're repeating, mm. um, uh, and, and there's certainly an echo of what happened 40 years ago happening today. Yeah. Um, I mentioned in, in the introduction that, that there's a lot of uh, archive footage in it, and it is really beautiful. I mean, despite the circumstances, the, the footage looks great. And it really uh, still has so much impact. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of getting that footage and well, where it's from? The Vietnam War was um, dubbed the Living Room War. It was one of right. the first wars in our country's history where that was really um, filmed pretty extensively. So uh, we had a good amount of source material from the front lines um, mm -hmm. that was covered by ABC, NBC, CBS. I would say primarily our footage came from NBC. Um, uh, and so we went, you know, into those archive houses. We had a great archive team, um, and and who went to really try to find the source material. So we weren't using the same material that people had used before, but going back to the source mm -hmm. and trying to find new information. We also got very lucky. One of the um, stories that we profile in the film is the story of the USS Kirk, which was a ship that was protecting the fleet. Way too big to land. The helicopters during those last 24 hours were going from the embassy to the fleet, dropping people off, coming back, picking people up, and taking them back right. and forth. And so the U.S. Kirk was monitoring that and protecting the fleet in case there was any enemy fire. And they ended up playing a significant and unexpected role in the evacuation, which plays itself out over the course of the film in fairly dramatic ways, as I think you know since you've seen the film. But um, uh, there was, a, it turned out that I happened to meet a man who uh, was a sailor on the Kirk mm -hmm. during that time, and a f mutual friend of ours who I had met during the research phase of this had said, you know, I talked to this sailor, and he uh, was up in his attic about four months ago, and he came across a box of Super 8 undeveloped footage from wow. the Kirk in 1975. Would you have any interest in that? So uh, I said, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yes, I'll I'll take a look at I, it. <laughs> I do have a lot of interest in that. Yeah. And so I called him, and I was then back in LA, and he was um, very protective of the footage and didn't want to FedEx it out to me. And so I sent him an airplane ticket, flew him out, and we went and developed it, and it was a treasure trove. And so I think um, we used about 12 minutes of his footage mm. in the film, but he has this extraordinary footage of helicopters being thrown off of the ships to make room for yeah, new that's helicopters. Very dramatic, um, obviously, yeah. The story of the, the Chinook, which you saw in the mm -hmm. film, where the family had to throw their children off of the top of the helicopter onto this moving ship. A uh, very dramatic story, and he has footage of all that. Um, footage at the end of the film where these ships are completely overcrowded in the South China Sea with uh, South Vietnamese who had fled the country. Um, and some moving footage within that sequence. So that was all his footage, and right. is footage uh, that nobody's ever seen before. Right, I was going to say, probably, uh, if anybody's seen it, maybe one, like, a very small number, if anybody. Right? Well, it hadn't been yeah. developed. Hadn't even been developed yet. Yeah. Oh. So, so. <laughs> Did he not? <laughs> he was like, as soon as he got out of there, he was like, probably didn't want to have anything. Well, you like, know, it's to, interesting to it. talking to the people uh -huh. who, who, you know, I think over the course of the film, it becomes pretty evident that there were real heroes sure. during this moment, yeah. and and um, and you know, there's some really extraordinary stories of of heroism, but at the time. They didn't think of themselves as heroes. Right, you know, they yeah. just thought of themselves as doing their jobs and saving the people who they thought should be saved, and um, which were, you know, the the South Vietnamese who were their friends, their mm -hmm. allies, often their family, um, and they did what they could, and they did the right thing in this um, very chaotic moment in history. And so, I don't think they ever saw it as something extraordinary. Right. Well, that's part of, in a way, a definition, I think, of what a hero is. It's, it's, it's sort of 
what somebody does in the moment without much forethought, you know, without, you know, it's like, anyway. Um, but uh, uh, w I did mention the Arc of I didn't say there were, there was actually quite a few um, uh, uh, people in it, uh, your interview, contemporary interviews in there, uh, with, with, with uh, various uh, people that were obviously uh, in Vietnam at the time, and uh, they collaborated with you. Um, did, uh, and then uh, you still see a lot of still very raw motion too, right? It's still something they're still very much uh, part of their, their lives. Yeah, I think that this, for, for many of them, was the defining moment of their lives. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, a heart-wrenching moment for many of them. One of uh, the people who we profile in the film, Stuart Harrington, tells the story of being at the U.S. Embassy at the very end, and they were trying to get as many Vietnamese out as possible, filling up the helicopters, not with Americans, but with Vietnamese to try to get them yeah. out of the country. And um, at 3.45 in the morning, they, the president ordered the ambassador to leave and for the evacuation to be shut down. And at that time, there were still 422 people, um, mm -hmm. Vietnamese, who were left in the embassy. And Stuart Harrington had the um, very uncomfortable job of having to reassure these 422 people that they would be, mm -hmm. that they were on American soil in the embassy, that they would be taken out, rest assured, that he was going to be the last person out. He wouldn't leave without them. And then he snuck out and got on the last helicopter or second to last helicopter out. And, um, you know, that moment haunts him. Of, and he talks about being on the helicopter yeah. as he uh, takes off from the embassy and looking down and seeing these 422 people and see, and feeling how wrong it was and how we really abandoned them and, it, you know, that it was kind of a metaphor for the larger war. He did uh, have an opportunity to sort of get a little closure, right, sometime, uh, more recently, at, right, wasn't he at a Sundance screening or something? Was well, that yeah, the so incident one of the 400, we interviewed one of the 422 people who had been left behind in the film, um, Bin, Bin Pho, and so when we had the screening at the premiere at Sundance last year, which was a, a wonderful event where, you know, no, no, none of us had seen the film in a big theater and none of the people who were in the film had ever seen the film. And about 12 of the uh, folks that we interviewed came to that screening. Mm -hmm. They came up with me to do the Q&A and this moment came up as a question and Stuart Harrington talked about it and talked about how he lived in fear of running into one of these 422. Yeah during the course of his life and would have nightmares about it and whatnot. And at that moment, Bin Pho took the microphone and said to Stu on stage, I want you to know I forgive you. Wow. I forgive you for leaving me. And it was this beautiful moment. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house, including mine. Right. Um, it was, you know, it's very emotional. So, you know, the, these are some extraordinary moments, I think, that um, it's really an honor for me to be able to share with folks and, and share this moment in history. Um, you must, I mean, I, you, you described one of the, uh, way, you know, one of the uh, instances of how you got some of the footage. With, um, but uh, I'm wondering, did you, did you script the film? I mean, there's so, many, there's so much content, I guess, is my point. And did you script things out first, and then you, it helped you kind of figure out what footage you were going to use? Or did yeah, you just... Yeah, you know, it's one of the, 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 the benefits um, of working in a, in a historical moment because you kind of, you know what happened <laughs> to a degree. Of sure. course, there's right. things that you discover along the way as yeah, you're interviewing people. But, yeah. you know, I kind of, um, and this story is, I think, probably more than any other film I've ever made, uh, both inherently dramatic and has a natural narrative mm -hmm. um, arc. I find that I'm often in edit rooms trying to, you know, construct the story, and this story was there, mm -hmm. you know, on a platter for me in many ways. Um, and so uh, we did have an outline and, and a, you know, an understanding of the events that took place and kind of what uh, the characters and stories we would want to tell that. Mm -hmm. And then as we went along in the edit, uh, I continued to do interviews of people who I felt like could kind of supplement the story and, and um, help us along the way, but I had a, a kind of solid sense of what the beginning, middle, and the end were. Mm -hmm. um, 
It's, uh, it's, uh, well, the film, uh, The Last Days of Vietnam, Vietnam it's been uh, shortlisted uh, for an Oscar. Congratulations on Thank that. You. Thank you. Um, and I, I certainly hope you get nominated. It can mean a lot for a little documentary, can't it? Well, I do think it, it can be meaningful. I mean, you know, listen, I think that there are so many deserving films that should be shortlisted. Sure. And um, I don't think it's the end all be all, but I do think that it can help elevate attention around a film. And, you know, that's, that's kind of icing and, and a nice perk mm -hmm. um, that, was, that comes both with, you know, getting on the shortlist and of course being nominated. Um, but I think there's, you know, there, there are many other awards and many other ways for films to have a, a wonderful life. And, um, and so I think it's important to, you know, just keep the focus on trying to share these stories, which is what we all want to do as documentary filmmakers with audiences mm -hmm. and impact and affect people. But, you know, of course, I'm, I'm deeply honored. Yeah, no. Uh, it, and so um, you've made the last, it, it, well, correct me if I'm wrong, the last two films now you've made have been kind of looking back. You, your film was Ethel right before? Yes. Your, the, the film you made about your mother, yes. Ethel Kennedy, and so, uh, which was on HBO, and now Last Days in Vietnam. So those two films sort of look backward. Uh, Although, as we know, they also usually resonate in some way to our lives today. But I'm wondering if, if you have a project coming up, uh, coming up maybe that you're thinking about making or you already started on? I have or? a few projects that I'm um, developing right now, but I'm not quite sure where, which right. one I'm going to do. Um, some are more, a little bit more historical, but mostly they're contemporary stories, more contemporary stories. You know, I think there's a lot of, uh, there can be a lot of value in looking back at certain events, yeah. particularly Vietnam, where, you know, there's a real sense of kind of repeating history. And I think that the right. film does raise important questions um, as we're, you know, continue to struggle to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan of, you know, what are our responsibilities to the people who are left behind, yeah. to the people who worked with us. You know, I think that the film is a reminder ultimately and probably, you know, the greatest value may be that it is a reminder of the human cost of war. And it's very much framed through these human stories. Um, and first-hand accounts, as you, I'm sure you notice, there's no narrator in the film. There are no historians mm -hmm. in the film. It's all the people who were there, who are on the front lines, and I think really helps us understand what is at stake for the people who are fighting these wars and for the people, you know, for example, we leave Vietnam, and Dan Pham, who's one of the Vietnamese who we interviewed, who worked for the Americans, who was promised to get out, he spent 13 years, the next 13 years, in a re-education camp mm. doing yeah. hard labor, right? So I think that it's important as we continue these engagements, and now we're getting back at, engaged with ISIS, to understand, well, what is our exit strategy? What is our... Um, you know, what is the end game here? What are our goals with this? And what happens to the people who are left behind? And what happens to the people who we have committed ourselves to when we leave? Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are important and really relevant questions. And I think that there is enormous value in looking back and understanding how um, these questions have played themselves out in other wars in our recent history. Well, let's hope the right people watch Yes. The film then. Yes. You know. um, well, the, again, the name of the film is uh, Last Days in Vietnam. And uh, again, appreciate your coming by and, and, and visiting with us today at the studio. Well, it's been great talking That's, to you. I appreciate you yeah, talking so, to me about it. And hope it makes, I hope you make it all the way to the red carpet, of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>